started here, uh, so we're going to move quickly uh, with some case presentations, just kind of discuss. I think if there's any questions from the crowd, anybody has any thoughts, ideas, feel free to uh, speak up. 45-year-old African-American physician with triple negative invasive ductal left breast cancer, T1N1, grade 3, who's a BRCA1 mutation carrier. Uh, she received weekly uh, Received weekly, and it should should be a, a, a paclitaxel carboplatin times 12 cycles, uh, followed by doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide. She then underwent uh, bilateral nipple sparing and mastectomies, achieving a complete pathologic response in the breast and lymph nodes, with 12 nodes removed, uh, and a treatment effect in uh, one of 12 nodes. Uh, past medical history significant for hypertension, uh, requiring two drugs. Family history of heart disease, ovaries intact. So I guess uh, for for uh, Neelima, I mean, what, what are your thoughts in regards to the chemotherapy? Is that your standard regimen for all patients? Any stratification of how you would treat this woman any differently than what she already received? No, because, um, because she was young, because she had a BRCA1 mutation, and she was in a positive, uh, I think that it's very reasonable to assume that she would have the carboplatin. Okay. Any, any, other, uh, any other treatment uh, out there in the... Yeah, that should be helpful. So, that's our policy medical oncologist, breast uh, in the DC area talking. So, she's going to get some policy to us so we can, down here in LA, we can do a better job. So, but, but it, is, it is a concern, you know, I think in different pockets of different insurance providers on what they'll pay for and not pay for. Yes. And that's kind of that's similar to what we do in ovarian cancer as well. Is you know bump you know do a weekly regimen um, if they have toxicity to it. So. And also in this era of costs and everything, I think that it requires far less growth factor mm -hmm. in our world and yours. And so I think uh, it's just easier. I guess next thing. So uh, Dr. Dias, could you speak a little bit about what patients? are candidates for a nipple sparing mastectomy versus not and was this was this patient a good candidate for it so first off nipple sparing mastectomies if you're just looking grossly at the patient this is crude but there's an awful lot of people whose nipples are not in the right place mm -hmm. and so the easiest thing is people walk in to me and say oh you need <coughs> nipple sparing mastectomies well if you just look at them right off the bat and the nipples are in the wrong place right there that's something that says they may not be the greatest candidate. Now, the actual surgical technique has changed a lot because the original nipple sparing mastectomies left the nipples right where they were. So if they're hanging way below the inflammatory fold, that's the way your final cosmetic result is going to be. The newer techniques and the newer oncoplastic techniques do involve some raising and elevating. So even those people who were not candidates from a sheer cosmesis are now thoughts are that, you know, from an oncologic standpoint, that, you know, you've got two issues. If you leave enough tissue to maintain the vascularity of the nipple, then you're leaving enough tissue to get a low, higher increase your chances of local recurrences. Mm -hmm. And some people will, you know, even in the best hands, um, the nipple sucrose sometimes as high as 25% of the time. So you really have to have a patient who's feed up understanding all those potential risks, you know, the risk of nipple necrosis, <coughs> the risk of a recurrence, all of those things have to be taken into place so they can be satisfied with their final results. But like I said, the new aquaplastic techniques, you learn how to raise them up. 
Yeah, one, uh, one question I have is it from, you know, personal experiences with friends and family members, you know, with breast cancer, as well as my own, you know, patients that, you know, uh, that I've seen for one reason or another that require, you know, mastectomy for, you know, either BRCA or breast cancer down the road, a second malignancy. My impression is that most of those patients after the discussion do not decide to have a nipple spare and they actually decide to have the whole, you know, breast removed. Is that, in your experience, is that similar to most, after that discussion of nipple sparing or not, most decide to do it or not to do it? I think, well, you know, I think the younger patients really want a nipple sparing because in the round of it, they're looking at, you know, because their cosmetic, in the younger patients, their cosmetics is going to be pretty much acceptable mm -hmm. with the younger spare patients. But the older patients, by the time we talk to them about what all they're going to have to do to raise up and their risk associated with the older patients really don't. It's a, from a, from a surgeon standpoint, it's a lot more stressful to try to do nipple sparings, you know, from the whole nine yards. What about tattoos? Oh, go ahead. I mean, tattoo of a nipple. I've had several patients who actually got a nipple tattooed after so, a reconstruction. So there are numerous ways, and it's always the plastic surgeon's discussion with the patient about how they do it, but sometimes they lift skin from other sites of the body and they can get a very cosmetically attractive thing by lifting skin. Sometimes, I call them nip and tuck, but they basically... No, no pun intended. No, no, they really, they can, under local anesthesia, Except that's tuck and tuck, nip. And they can really pretty nipple, and then come back and tattoo around it. Yeah. And then the newer things are 3D tattoos. And let me tell you, if you ever see a 3D tattoo, they are wonderful. There is a guy in New Orleans, I mean, you look at it, and this is crude, but you say, I have to touch, because I can't believe it's a flat surface. But I mean, the, the 3D tattooing is phenomenal. Yeah. We don't want to go to one with that, whenever we drive. Yeah. I have a quick question. This is the... He's speaking to the mic, please. Sorry, so this, is a, this is a breast medical oncologist, so forgive me. But what, is, what do the surgeons mean when they say they court out the nipple to make sure that there's no malignant cells? Can you talk a little bit about that? So one of the thoughts are that there might be tumor behind the nipple. And so what some of the studies have suggested that you should do is if you're going to do a true nipple sparing mastectomy, as you're raising the, and, and it also depends on where you put your flaps. You make an implementary incision fold incision or how you do it. But the bottom line is when you're reaching the nipple alveolar complex, you actually sample that tissue and try to prove or disprove whether or not there's malignancy there. Well, you know, the kind of the problem with that is if you've got a tumor that's remote in location, there's not going to be nipple alveolar complex involved in up front. And if you have a tumor that's sitting there close, why would you even think that you can get good enough margins? So it seems more like a common sense thing about whether or not you really want to do that. Because most of the people with a remote tumor, I mean, the chance of you having tumor cells up there in your nipple alveolar complex is pretty slim. But, the, but you actually take a little piece of tissue back there, send it for a frozen section with the concept that if I can identify tumor right now, I'm not going to spare the nipple complex. So, uh, what, if you can keep that in mind, so what's the role of a sibilino biopsy versus a full axillary dissection in this patient? So, so you know, again, the studies are controversial, but I kind of go by the old school that says that your nodal evaluation is simply diagnostic and it's not therapeutic. And so I think, and the studies aren't there yet to say that sentinel node technique works post neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But I think all of us will do it and have pretty strong belief in what it is. But I would, you know, to me, I like to do a simple node even afterwards and, and just try to identify those nodes more so than to give them to pathologists so they know which nodes to look further. Because the original sentinel node trials were done and what they found, which I don't think we were all really thinking they were going to do this and look at it, is they upstaged people. When the sentinel node boxes were done, they upstaged people because what they did was they took those nodes and assessed them a lot more looking a lot more for tumors sure. so they upstage people. So I think if you do a simple node on these people post chemotherapy and then you find tumor, 
then it's just going to push them more to shoot them to the to the rad op person. Yeah, and I think, and also the controversy, what little I know, is that with the ultra staging and then also the use of IHC and micrometastasis is kind of a um, wax and wane topic in regards to should you treat a micrometastasis differently than not, and uh, there's other tumor sites we look at that as well. So I, uh, so next, uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Outlaw. So for this patient, you know, is there a post, you know, mastectomy radiation therapy indication? I'll go back to her uh, previous uh, history. So, so um, when you talk about post mastectomy radiation therapy, it's been kind of an evolving target, especially over the last um, several years. So. Historically speaking, when you look at the post mastectomy um, randomizing to post mastectomy radiation versus not, it was ladies who had even a single positive lymph node um, involved were included in those trials. And over time, and basically a lot of that is due to uh, some data, retrospective data that came out of a few of the big institutions. Um, radiation therapy was primarily considered in women who had T3, T4 disease or uh, greater than three lymph nodes involved. When you look at the most recent uh, guidelines that were uh, published actually by uh, a court consortium group with ASCO, ASTRO, um, Society of Surgeons, what's the That's MSS, SSO? Um, and um, when you look at their treatment guidelines, um, they um, basically say that in general, post mastectomy radiation therapy has been um, effective for most patients or all patients, whether they have one lymph node versus four. Um, however, one of the things that you have to understand that those early trials in post mastectomy radiation therapy were with patients who had adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and the question um, and debate is whether or not someone who has had neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a complete pathologic response, is that something that is relevant to those, um, to those patients? And if you um, look at their um, look at their guidelines, one of their uh, caveats is they essentially say when you have a patient who had clinical T1, T2, uh, N0 to N1 um, positive nodes with a complete or positive or breast cancer with a complete pathologic response, they kind of hem and hop on that because they say there is not enough evidence to support um, routine omission or um, application or giving post mastectomy radiation therapy in that <coughs> population group and suggest that patients in that um, in those meeting that criteria go on a clinical trial. The caveat is, is that we oftentimes get patients who may have a complete <coughs> pathologic response at the primary and not at the nodes or the reverse where there may be residual disease at the primary site but a complete pathologic response in the nodes and I think the data and the guidelines are pretty clear that if you have a patient who has had neoadjuvant chemotherapy and they have residual node disease that those patients um, should routinely get post mastectomy radiation therapy um, but the guidelines are were a little less firm if they just had uh, residual disease at the primary site. So in generally speaking, when I think about post mastectomy uh, radiation therapy, I, I kind of look at, um, are we talking about a patient who is coming to me after neoadjuvant chemotherapy? And also I look at their original stage disease. Even if they have a complete pathologic response but they had T3 disease where they had a um, inflammatory breast cancer, I think the guidelines are pretty clear in that population that those ladies should get post mastectomy radiation therapy. But if we just take a step back and look at this particular case, you have, you have to consider whether or not the benefits of your treatment um, to minimize the risk of local recurrence and to provide the overall survival benefits seen in some patients with post mastectomy radiation therapy, does that outweigh the risk? 
And in this particular case, can we go back? Yes. She had um, a T1 lesion, so she had a tumor that was less than two centimeters. She had only one lymph node that was involved at the time of, 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 um, of her original diagnosis, and she had a complete pathologic response in somebody who, as we talked about, kind of what I talked about at the end of my discussion today was, you have to start looking not just at the tumor, but what other risk factors could this person have for developing coronary artery disease down the line. And this lady had a, uh, an adequate lymph node dissection, so I don't, her risk of harboring additional uh, disease and lymph nodes that hadn't been resected are pretty small. This would be one of those ladies, even though she has a no positive triple negative breast cancer, um, that I think would be safe to observe with the caveat that if you ask 100 radiation oncologists, you might get 101 answers. <laughs> because it is a very controversial um, area in, in discussion in radiation oncology. So summarized answer is yes? No. <laughs> no. Okay. This lady okay. would be a no. Okay. <laughs> and I would say that sometimes I'm an, out, I'm an outlier. I think of, with radiation therapy, I try to think of do I have a good reason to give it as opposed to some people or if it's post mastectomy radiation therapy I have to have a very good reason not to give it and it's a fine distinction but it's it's a very different way to look at it and I don't know if one way is right or wrong maybe because I'm in a um, a different generation of, of radiation oncologists where you're trying to think first do no harm um, and in this particular case, I think that the benefit of radiation therapy could potentially not outweigh the risk in someone like her. Yeah, I was unaware that the radiation oncologist could say the words, she does not need radiation. <laughs> <laughs> Where I trained, that was not a, you know, it was not a, So one other comment, though, yes. is you, you're saying that she's T1N1, and I can accept the T1 because our imaging and all pretty much is reasonable to say it's a T1 tumor based on imaging size one, which is what you got to go with. But you're saying N1 because we really don't know what to categorize those people. So if you're saying N1, you've proven that she has at least a node involved. But you really don't know how many nodes she's got involved. So you really don't know up front for neoadjuvant whether she's got N1, N2, or whatever. And But you have got a complete pathologic response. So in this case, this is the one that any patient like this, I want them on trial. Because the trial is there. And, and this is where I think that it would be tremendously beneficial to put the, all of these people on trial and we have that trial. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I was just going to say, how much do you reliably depend on the whole treatment effect and the lymph nodes? Uh, you know, let's say that there was treatment effect only in one of the nodes. Would you? Um, yeah, I don't know. Would yeah, go I believe that it was probably okay. yeah. And I, I think, if I might add, um, that we do have, we don't have prospective data, but I think that we have some pretty good um, retrospective data, which is actually a pooled analysis of a patient who had a complete pathologic response after neoadjuvant chemotherapy and um, mastectomy. Uh, MD Anderson and there's some place in Canada that pooled their data and actually looked um, at those patients and found that radiation, their uh, local recurrence rate in people who had a complete pathologic response in stage one and two, they actually didn't have any patients who had a local recurrence. Um, and this was maybe 250 patients, and I, I'm pretty sure they had a median survival of, or median, um, they followed them for at least uh, 10 years. But when you looked at stage three um, patients, the difference, their local recurrence rate was 7%, um, percent, 5%, 5% to 7% in patients who did receive post-mastectomy radiation <coughs> therapy versus 33% um, in women who did not receive uh, post-mastectomy radiation. And the benefit of radiation was also seen in progression-free and overall survival. So um, I, this lady would, would have fallen right into the category of patients that they looked at. And even though it is not um, prospective data, I think that that is still um, pretty convincing data to support at least the idea that not all patients with no positive breast cancer need to have post-mastectomy radiation therapy.
especially in someone who has a strong family history of, uh, of heart disease. She already has hypertension on two medicines, and it's you know also illustrates the fact that radiation oncologists actually do a history. <laughs> Contrary to, to popular disease, right? All right, well, let's, um, for the interest of time, just kind of move on a little bit with um, time in the oophorectomy, Dr. Scalisi, and this 48-year-old with a BRCA1 uh, gene mutation, 45, excuse me. Uh, what is your thoughts in regards to time in oophorectomy? Say you saw her at time of diagnosis for breast cancer. Uh, when do you think is the optimal time to do that? She's 45 with the BRCA. Yeah, BRCA1 mutation. mutation. So optimal timing for her would have been, you know, age 35, when she was done with childbearing, but I digress, we're not there. Yes. Um, so. Wait, how does that have an effect on breast? So with BRCA1 mutation, there is, what you're getting with a risk-reducing uh, uh, ophorectomy is a 90% reduction in her ovarian cancer risk, but you're also getting about a 50% reduction in breast cancer risk. So had we taken her ovaries out 10 years ago, it's possible that she wouldn't have had a breast cancer to start with. Yes, yeah, so the slide says oophorectomy. Would you leave her tubes behind? So that's a good question, Dr. Riccardi. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> ovarian cancer, we call ovarian cancer, but the likelihood is this is all tubal cancer uh, that drips onto the tube, and we call it ovary cancer because back in the day, the way we made diagnoses were whichever organ had the most tumor on it, that's where it started. Um, but in reality, after we had done oophorectomies on 10 to 15 years worth of high risk, uh, either BRCA carriers or high risk uh, ovarian cancer family histories, we would go back and look at the tubes and if we ever found an occult ovarian cancer, almost 100% of the time they were in the tube and they were small. Uh, and we discovered some molecular markers that came along with that and when you go back and you look, a lot of these uh, tubal signatures are found in the tubes of ovarian cancer patients. So if you go back and look at their tubes, you can almost see where that thing evolved, and it's likely that it came from the tube in the first place. So prior to discovering all of that, the way that you get risk reduction for ovarian cancer, because there's no screening test, because there likely won't ever be, um, for what we're looking for was to take the tubes and ovaries out. And where you get the most bang for your buck for ovarian cancer risk reduction is to take them out premenopausally. So you take them out age 35 or greater, or really 35 or better, um, or when they finish having kids. Uh, that's kind of treating it like a sledgehammer. You're talking about taking out the tubes and ovaries of a 35 year old who's got at least maybe 15 to 20 years worth of you know, it's hormonal support, and you're you're condemning them to menopause. And I like to describe it like, you know, you're in your car and you drive along and you get off the off ramp and you cruise to a stop. That's menopause. Mm -hmm. yeah, you get a little bump in the road, there's some potholes, whatever. But when you take the tubes and ovaries out of a 35 year old, you're slamming your car into a brick wall. So there's a lot of of toxicity, so to speak, that comes along with that. And now that we know that most of this ovarian cancer is coming from the tube. Is it possible that instead of taking out the ovaries of these young women, could you get away with just taking out the tubes? And it's likely that you are getting a risk reduction there, but there's no data right now to say how much. And that's how I counsel my patients who don't want to go through menopause but also want to maximize their risk reduction. Yeah, it's possible that we can just take the tubes out, absolutely, and, and probably the uterus for that matter, because they're, if they're done with it. Because uh, it's an innocent bystander with uh, uh, hormonal production, but it may not be with BRCA uh, mutation. There's potential that uterine papillary serous cancer uh, correlates with the BRCA mutation. So we'll talk about taking out the tubes and the uterus, and then in a couple of years when we've had time to kind of wrap our heads around things, and maybe when we have a little more data come back and get the ovaries. Mm -hmm. So yes, it would have been possible when she was right. you know, 35 to say, all right, let's take these tubes out and maybe we get some risk reduction. The hard part in that counseling is I can't give you a number. I have no idea how much that's going to reduce your risk. It likely will, but I can't say it's 90 percent. So what about uh, not so much a time in uh, you know, a BSO, uh, but would you offer a patient, say this same patient with those BRCA wild types, so BRCA negative, um, would you still offer that patient a BSO for risk reduction for ovarian cancer? With breast cancer like this? Personal history of breast cancer. 
Um, triple negative, young, triple negative. and diagnosis. Yeah, I think it's reasonable. So the deal is we have no screening test. There's no mammogram for ovary cancer. There's no tamoxifen for ovary cancer. You can take birth control pills. Uh, you can take an aspirin. We think those yeah. things reduce the incidence of ovary cancer maybe by 30%, but that's a population study, and it's, it's not it's not great data. Um, so well, and I'll also add to it. It's been a while since I looked at this literature specifically, but if you took a patient whose mother, you know, had uh, breast cancer in early age, so not a personal history, but you know, family history, is that even if mom and the patient were BRCA negative, uh, there's a fourfold increased chance of having breast or ovarian cancer for that patient. Now, so it's not uh, that takes it for ovarian cancer. That's a one less than one percent of the general population up to 4% on a cancer that is always in advanced stage. And so I, I, think it's, um, I think it's reasonable to have that discussion, but again, the data is not uh, strong in that regard. Anyone? What age do you guys recommend for BRCA2? Because I've had patients get something nectomies, uh, but um, you know, and, uh, yes, for BRCA2, because I feel like your threshold is a little bit higher. It's a little later. So BRC1 is 35, and I believe BRCA2 is like 40 to 45, but it's closer to 40. It's, it's about five years later because the incidence of over cancer BRC2 occurs a little bit later. So, um, Hormonal replacement, replacement therapy, therapy for this patient, or a triple negative, um, you know, therapy, would not have a problem with it? I mean, you know, we counsel them that we don't know definitely, but I mean, with the triple negative breast cancer, bilateral mastectomies, both parectomies, even though, you know, yes, I would have no problem with it, at least for a short course, that would be one that would be on it until they were 60. Right. Uh, but, yeah, I agree. So the whole reason we're doing this is to reduce risk. And, and let me clarify that. That's hormonal replacement therapy. therapy. Not, therapy. Not, 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 not therapy. therapy. Right. Um, the whole point in doing this is to improve longevity. And longevity doesn't matter if you're miserable. Uh, and if this woman is 45 years old and I take out her tubes and ovaries and she can't get out of bed in the morning because she was up all night with hot flashes, if she can't you know, maintain relationships because the, the mood swings. And what is the point of living a life that it, you, you can't get out of the door in the morning? And if estrogen is going to fix that, then then we need to do it. Uh, and any uh, any non-hormonal agents that you try first? I think it's a whole lecture on this. Oh, that's true. Right. That's true. That's true. But there are, and I will defer to Dr. Pierce. But there are, and I think that's what the guidelines would say: is that you maximize. <laughs> The guidelines say refer to Dr. Pearson. Dr. Pearson. <laughs> the guidelines would suggest that you try all of your non-hormonal agents first. Um, the SSRIs, the effectors, uh, some of the, the uh, over the kind of black cohosh, that kind of stuff, I think is reasonable. But in a 45-year-old or a 30-year-old, it is unlikely. Yeah, you're, it's unlikely that you're going to get major symptom relief with just that. You can. But I, I would not not give her estrogen if everything else failed, simply because she had a history of triple negative breast cancer. All right, we'll, uh, we'll move, move on, on to the second, second case, which will be quick, just so we can keep things moving. Unless there's any questions or across the breast for our panel right now. Yes, ma'am. I hate to add to the time issue, but because that first patient had never seen their breast cancer, they didn't have the surgery. I'm assuming she's going to want to So I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Outlaw. Would you do the uh, radiation prior to reconstruction or after? Well, luckily for this patient, I wouldn't be offering her radiation therapy at, at all. But if it was someone who um, needed to have, um, really needed to have radiation therapy, for instance, if she had residual disease in her lymph nodes, I think that's um, for most of radiation oncologists. Um, and uh, breast oncologists would agree that that is um, an absolute indication for uh, post mastectomy radiation, barring some other uh, unforeseen circumstance, then you would offer to that. Um, generally speaking, those patients are going to have tissue expanders placed um, at the time of their mastectomy. Um, and my caveat with that um, is that once we need to get them inflated to where the plastic surgeon wants them to be and we don't touch them 
during radiation therapy because that would really change uh, the radiation dose if, if they're expanding them during the radiation treatment. So generally speaking, we wait, let them get um, the maximum expansion that they need. We give them the radiation therapy. And then once they're healed, um, for most patients, it's going to be six months or a year that they go back and then they have their reconstruction. Although I, I will say that we, I try to avoid giving post mastectomy radiation therapy in people who, who have had immediate reconstruction, but sometimes that happens because they get an unexpected pathology re report. And so at that point, you have to counsel the patient about their risk of developing poor cosmesis and really contracture. That really becomes um, the issue because it can be not only disfiguring, it can be very painful and affect their quality of life. And really depending on uh, whose data um, you believe, um, I, I quote that usually to patients as a risk of about 25%. All right, cervical cancer case. Um, so uh, Miss AB is a 35-year-old African-American female, para-3, recently diagnosed with a stage 1B squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. Physical exam shows a 2-centimeter ectocervical lesion anteriorly, no vaginal or parametrial involvement. BMI is 29. She's Alabama skinny. Uh, we have uh, no significant past medical history. So Dr. Scalisi, what do you recommend? So you went there. So, I would recommend a radical hysterectomy. Okay, we'd like to thank you for your time today, and you guys have a good time. So, so, radical hysterectomy. So, by, by which route of radical would yeah. you hysterectomy so, you form? Prior to two weeks ago, slam dunk, I would say we're going to do pelvic node dissection and a robotic radical hysterectomy. Okay. Post two weeks ago, we have to have a little talk, the patient and I. Yeah, so, so look, let's just, before you go to... Let's forget about two weeks ago. So, before two weeks ago, what would you recommend? Robotic radical hysterectomy. In the stage. Stage. Okay. Stage. So, so you did not go to SGO. You were not in New Orleans, and you missed the morning session. Um, and, it did not happen. And, the, and so, Allegedly. there was a study that looked at stage, you know, advanced stage, uh, or excuse me, early stage uh, cervical cancer, and randomized between total abdominal radical versus laparoscopic radical slash robotic radical hysterectomy. Um, so anyway, so the patient, and at that study it showed that there was a difference in survival. The patients who had a laparoscopic approach did worse than those patients who had an abdominal approach. Mm -hmm. Although I would say the standard has been long in the United States to perform laparoscopic minimally invasive surgery for this disease. So your patient said, but doctor, didn't I see that survival for cervical cancer is lower in patients having robotic surgery? So how, now, how would you how would you reply to that station uh, to that patient where there's data showing? Well, first of all, said study yes. uh, it was presented as an interim analysis. All right, this was a, an analysis that was done to determine whether or not the trial could continue. By no means is it complete, and I believe it only presented about thirty percent of its data. Of those thirty percent, uh, I think only fourteen percent of the minimally invasive radical hysterectomies were robotic. And what was the absolute number? 24? Yeah, so, so here it is here. Here's the uh, chart from, from the study. Um, so 274 patients had abdominal approach uh, and 291 had a laparoscopic. Um, and you can see there, out of the minimally invasive cohort, 16%, only 45 out of a total of what? Um, you know, what is that? So five, yeah, lots of patients, so uh, 600 patients. Mm -hmm. Right, so not very many of them were done robotically, and this was an international study, I didn't add. So this, this had sites in South America, uh, where, uh, there's some, uh, South, in, in Europe, Europe, South, South America. America. They, they did include some countries where the incidence of cervix cancer was astronomically high, mm -hmm. uh, and they were doing a lot of robotic, or a lot of radical hysterectomies. In my opinion, in, in my hands, I do not feel comfortable with a laparoscopic robotic or a laparoscopic radical hysterectomy. Right. A straight, straight stick, stick, yeah. Yeah, because you are limited by the dexterity of the instruments, you are limited by the visualization on a 2D TV screen, and I think there is a very significant difference between what kind of margins I get robotically versus what I think I could get laparoscopically. So with robotic 
robot, robotic radical hysterectomy, you've got a 3D image on a high def screen that is magnified times 10. You also have instruments with seven degrees of freedom uh, of dexterity. So when you are dissecting out the parametrium, which is a very ambiguous space, it is literally just floppy tissue somewhere between the cervix and the hip bone, essentially. Uh, you've got to have the precision and dexterity. That's, that's, that's attached to the leg bone? It's attached to the leg bone, okay. and then you take it all around. Okay. <laughs> but you have to have the precision and the dexterity to determine what that margin actually is. And laparoscopically, I feel like you're just grabbing tissue and you call it a day. Um, well, I agree. And I, in fellowship, I've only attempted three total laparoscopic radical hysterectomies with one of my attendants. And we abandoned that approach. It was really before we started doing robotics for that. And we abandoned it just because we didn't feel satisfied with our margins uh, on this tumor. So since you brought up margins, since I added some margins, you know, I think it's important to look at the differences between, in this study, the, the abdominal approach versus the laparoscopic approach. Because when we first saw that with the survival curves, I think the inclination was well, these were different patient cohorts. It had to be something different about the pathology. But if you look at lymphascular space invasion, you know, the parametrium being positive or negative, or the vaginal margins being positive or negative, they were all similar between both groups. So how, how do you interpret that data now? Because, I mean, that's why you don't do it straight stick. That's why I don't do it is for fear of margins. But, you know, there are people who do straight stick because that's all they have, and I'm sure they're quite skilled at it. And by this data, it looks like they are. And so why is there a difference in survival then? You mean because of the pathology all being the same? Yeah, so pathology is so the same. So there was no central pathology review, number one. Mm. So each site had its own pathologist reviewing said slides, which is fine, but if you have a, a study that you were going to make such a sweeping uh, practice change on, I would like to have a central pathology review, knowing that there's going to be variance in how that's reviewed. So is it possible? Because grade was not on here either. Correct. So are high-grade tumors just going to recur more frequently? And were there more high-grade tumors in the abdominal or the, the uh, minimally invasive group? We don't know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it looked like, and these are these are sites, and that was the argument. These are sites in uh, South America, for instance, who are doing you know 30 straight stick radical hysterectomies a month. They should know what they're doing, and they should be able to achieve that margin. I don't feel comfortable with it because it's not what I do. Sure. Well, and, and I think we've, or my personal philosophy is that a hyster radical hysterectomy is a radical hysterectomy, and we're just talking about the routes, you know, and so whether it's a abdominal, laparoscopic, or robotic, it's still the same procedure. But, you know, I was, I was hoping that we might have a patient advocate in the room, maybe someone who speaks on, you know, cervical cancer and has their own, oh, hey, Tamika, what are you doing back there? So one former patient, so, sweetheart, can I ask you, as, as a famous, uh, famous too patient much, advocate, you know, and, and, and personal survivor of cervical cancer, who uh, Rob Bristow took even tagged you on Twitter, who using the hashtag GYN social media. Well, so for me, and yes, Rob Bristow cut me with a knife, um, and I've been fine 17 years later. Um, and <laughs> And counting. And counting. Um, That's the Rob of those debulking papers. Yeah. Well, so for me, um, because I have so much access to patients, and again, I know you all do too, um, this scared a lot of patients. Um, so the scenario that's up there is correct. Um, we're still talking about it, actually. I'm sorry, I, I knew you wanted to answer, I don't have one. Um, but, but I guess how, you know, if, if we were to go back 17 years ago, and, um, and you're talking with Dr. Bristow, and, and he recommended at that time we had robotics, and this was available, what, 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 what would you Well, know? he looked like he was 12 when he walked in the room. Well, he looks, he, he looks 17 now. Yeah, yeah. I got that age. So I probably would have been like, what? So, but, um, yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, as one of our um, survivor ambassadors wrote, she was like, robotic surgery is relatively new. It has its benefits. But studies have shown that there is a risk of reoccurrence. Um, I think it's the same thing for me when I talk about the trachelectomy with patients mm -hmm. when they ask me. Um, I think if you 
are just diagnosed as early stage cervical cancer and you are wanting to have a baby immediately, that procedure works. For me, I'm against it because I feel like most of the patients that I encounter, not just in the U.S., but in other places, they always have a reoccurrence of cervical cancer when they have it. So, um, for me, it, it's my opinion. Well, I, I I'm not say, a doctor. Well, <laughs> I would add to that is that, you know, when a trachelectomy we just remove, or after trachelectomy, just remove the cervix, leave the uterus and, and you know, tubes and ovaries behind, uh, it, it is, there's data, you know, and what we see is that uh, both the, I guess the cancer outcomes compared to controls and the fertility outcomes are reasonable. I would say, and this is one of the point, talking points from this, because I'm glad you brought up trachelectomy, because we have more data and more patients with robotic, you know, radical hysterectomies than we probably tenfold than what we do for trachelectomies. And so I think the data is actually probably stronger, even though this study suggests that, you know, the survivors might not be as good. And, and, I, and, and what I wanted to say is I still need to research it more. Sure. I think we all do. I think that's probably yeah. hard to point. So, so um, but for me, I always want to do what is best um, for the patients and their outcomes for their quality of life mm -hmm. beyond their cancer, um, which starts with having a great medical team, which is why you are all here, because obviously you care and you want the best and you want to do more. So thank you for that. Um, I think that um, one of the things that I do know from women who have had robotic surgeries is that the, um, the rates of recovery are better for them. Um, I'm remembering my own and, you know, it was rough, but again, I've had no issues. I'm not Alabama skinny. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that was a different type of cancer you were talking about, but yes, I feel like, um, I don't have an answer right now. Yeah. No. It, it, I, I well, it, 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 it's, there's no, I think that's part of it though, right, from not only a patient advocate standpoint, because I think it's very individualized, but I think what what we as all GYN oncologists are struggling with is what is the right answer here, and, and, and I think we need to study it more, but one thing that's interesting is, and Jennifer, I just want you to touch on, she talked about that, you know, when there's, why is there a difference in survival when, you know, the surgical pathologic outcomes were the same, uh, and the you know, is it is there what's different? Why why it's like why am I just open in the abdomen, and that's going to improve someone's you know survival upon doing it laparoscopically? That doesn't make sense to me, not intuitive. But you had some pretty insightful thoughts on, on that. And these ABC patients, almost all of them said they wish they didn't know this information. Yeah, right? yeah. And that's the problem with the information. They, they, it's an interim analysis. It is not by, by any means a final answer. But they were concerned enough about the data that they, they struggled with whether or not to present it in that forum or not. And if it does impact you know, patient decision making, then yeah, we probably need to know. And, and it's not the answer that we wanted, but it, it is what it is. And we have to wait and get the rest of the data and study our own before we can get there. But in regards to just the bio, how biologically is it possible that the route of your surgery could impact survival to that extent. I, it doesn't make sense to me. What could be changing? I mean, we just had a whole convoluted talk on immunotherapy and how complicated that you, is. You said I that I never said that. Yeah, it was, because it is. You know, it's, is it possible that opening the abdomen, you know, exposes to something that incites an immune response? I mean, you, we get less abscess, we get less infection, we get better recovery with a robotic surgery. We have higher infection rates, we get higher access rates with an open surgery. Is it possible that that's a vaccine of sorts? Yeah. You know, is that inciting some type of response that kills whatever remaining cells are there? And theoretically, it, there should not be any because right. the, the, the path was the same. So I have no idea that, that those were a couple of things kind of rolling around in my head, but that I still don't. No, no one has it, and I agree. One, one, thing that, one thing I'll share is right after that presentation, a good friend of ours walked up to me. Uh, she practices in California, a few years my junior, and she says she was so disappointed. She's like, I'm so disappointed with results. What are you going to do now, Dr. Recovery? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to take my cervical cancer patients, take them to Brazil and do a straight stick probiotic radical, I mean, straight stick like a, a radical hysterectomy. I'm probably going to, until I have some definitive answer, not an interim analysis, I can't see it changing my practice right now. Now we're, we, you know, all of us, as well as this person in California that I'm referring to, and several institutions, we're going to start going through our own data. I mean, I think it's, 
You know, our, our perceptions of what's going on is that it hasn't changed anything from a current standpoint. But uh, I think it's going to be helpful for us to look at our own data to everybody kind of do that in, in, and then, you know, wait for the final, you know, analysis. But I'm not sure that practice patterns, surgical technique, not saying it's better, you know, same or worse, but I can't see a mostly international study changing what I do from a surgical standpoint when I perceive our patients for the most part do well. And I agree. And I guess her point was it's out there, it's on forums, it's in the news. Those patients are going to come in and ask that question. Yeah. And I think and it's worthy of discussion. I really just like the trichotectomy discussion. There's a lot of from patients, they have concerns about it. And um, yeah, I think it's worthy of discussion. So. Are there any plans to do a that, that, that was one of the questions at the presentation. Yeah, yeah I, I think they should, and I think they're, uh, I haven't spoken to Rodriguez who, who presented it, but, but um, I imagine with the feedback they have received, it's probably going to be Outside of that, the other thing that is really frustrating is that it was an exceptionally well-designed study. Which is, which is so frustrating. <laughs> because yeah. I mean, it doesn't tell, it's it yeah. something that doesn't tell what you think. But, but it's an interim analysis. I mean, it, it, those, those curves could flip or, or come closer together with time. So, all right, well, any, any questions in regards to that? Um, yeah, and, and one quick thing about that app is there, there's a filter. You can search by disease site. And then when you click on the, uh, the actual trial, there's a link to the clinicaltrials.gov site. So you can look at a more expansive view. And probably most importantly, there's a contact, you know, the uh, you know, point person. And so when you click that contact information, it automatically pulls up an email that links the clinicaltrials.gov, you know, number to Wendy and myself. And so that email comes in so we can get it and respond in a, in a very timely fashion. Uh, so we get that in real time. And then there's also, uh, Susan alluded to, there, there's a, uh, a, a physician contact link as well. So all the MCI physicians are on there. Not everyone can get all the information as far as personal information, but there's codes to be able to get my cell phone number or things like that that Susan can help arrange for. You know me and I can provide that code for you to be able to. And I'd like to thank uh, Tamika for answering everything so much. No, you did great, so I appreciate, we definitely appreciate the input. Thanks everybody, we'll see you at the reception.